So having, I hope, successfully quelled the myth in the last nugget that Scrum is only for small projects, that Scrum doesn't scale, this nugget is focusing on squashing the next myth about Scrum and that Scrum only works in a single location. Scrum does not work in a distributed environment. And again, in this nugget, we're going to focus on what it takes to make Scrum work in a distributed mode. And distribute literally can be international. And I'm going to say worldwide. The principles we're going to discuss in this nugget apply whether your Scrum team is distributed across a city, across a country, a continent, or even worldwide. Scrum will be functional in a distributed environment, but I will admit it is more work. It is harder to do distributed Scrum, but it absolutely is possible. We can distribute Scrum by team. So we have a team in Canada, which is where I'm from, as you can probably tell by my accident and accent and my A's. It can be a team in the US, a team in Europe, a team in Asia. Or the team can be distributed within the team. So within the team one, we have a person from Canada who is a J2EE person and a team from the US who is also J2EE and a team from Europe who has G J2EE, where in this case, we're distributing our teams by their skills, independent of where they are located. So again, which form of distribution works for your project is going to depend on the composition of your project and your teams. The key to distributed Scrum is we have to try hard to make it work. It is a little harder, but I'll share with you some ways to make it work. And as I discussed in the scaling of Scrum, more appropriate in the distributed Scrum, tools are key. Having manual charts pasted in our project workspace isn't going to work very well when our team is distributed around the world. So we absolutely will need to have tools to support not only our product backlog automation, but a lot, also a lot of our other Scrum artifacts and our progress charts. But let's focus first on how we're going to manage and how we're going to distribute our teams. And the simplest, and I would suggest probably the most obvious way to distribute Scrum is we distribute by team. As I said, we can have a team in Canada, a team in the US, a team in Europe, and a team in Asia, or wherever your geographies take you. And each team works as a Scrum team. So all of the principles that we discussed with scaling of Scrum very much applies to the concepts of distributed Scrum, where our teams are distributed by geography. So we have a co-located team in Canada or multiple co-located teams in a same office building in Canada and this, a co-located team or multiple co-located teams in each of our geographies. And really almost every one of the principles that we discussed in large or scaling of Scrum applies here. Probably the only principle of dealing with a large scaled Scrum and distributed Scrum is it's harder to move the team members around. Obviously, it's very easy to take Sally from team one and put Sally in team two. So we have the cross pollination and cross communications across the teams when they're all located on the same floor of the office building is a little bit harder when we have to move Sally from Canada to the US to Europe or to Asia. Harder, not impossible. And as a matter of fact, many proponents of distributed Scrum still recommend moving the team around. Have Sally go to the US or go to Europe for not a sprint or two, but for months. And the value of having Sally leave her cozy home in Canada and go and live in one of the other Scrum locations is absolutely astronomical 
the value you're going to get from having a team member move from one location to another. It's going to establish everything we expect it to do in terms of sharing of knowledge. It's going to gel the team. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to, because as we'll discuss a little later in the nugget, you can't beat the value of face-to-face, -face, recognizing that we have a distributed team. We'll discuss various ways of dealing with face-to-face -face in terms of video calls, et cetera, et cetera. But moving Sally from one location to another is absolutely going to allow Sally to impart the norms, the practices, the principles of how her team works in Canada and allow Ta Sally to understand the norms and the principles of how the teams in the other locations work. Obviously, it's somewhat disruptive to Sally, unless Sally, of course, wants to be a world traveler, in which case it's a perk to Sally. So the selection of the individual who you may want to do the moving around from team to team is going to be a very personal selection. As I would say, I don't necessarily think a, a team member who is a family-based individual with, with uh, a, a spouse and a number of children is necessarily going to want to move to another location for months. But there may be individuals on your team who absolutely would just welcome the chance to be a world traveler on company expenses and do it. So don't, don't just automatically assume you can't move the team around, but consider the values of moving the team around. And other than that, as I said, distributed Scrum is very similar to large Scrum when the Scrum is distributed by team with one, again, overriding factor that where possible, it's very advantageous to match your SMEs with the team. So if the Canadian team is focused on the financial area, ideally the financial SME should be co-located with the Canadian scrum team. And again, I think that's probably self-evident or self-obvious that because we need to have this ability to ask the questions. Pardon me, do you have 10 minutes to review this story? That's going to work far better when the SMEs and the teams are co-located. Not critical, pretty close to critical, but not critical if you have reasons why your SMEs can't be in the same location as your teams. Again, in a future this topic in this nugget will discuss ways to make it work, but ideally, if we can do that, it's the best way to make our distributed teams work. A less common approach for distributed Scrum is the teams are distributed geographically within the team. So we have team one has a Canadian, has a US, has a European, and has an Asian team member as does team two and so on and so on. As I say, this will be more common when your teams are going to have skill specific, such as J2EE, C sharp, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, I don't know that I would deliberately try to build my team where I've got my skills or my team distributed across the geography. But if you have reasons, if you ha have a, a limited number of J2EE experts in your organization and you need to have a team focused on J2EE, then it absolutely can work. My key comment is select your teams carefully. Your teams have to want to make it work. They have to be committed to making this distributed environment work because it is going to take more time. So how do we select the team carefully? How do we make sure that the team wants to make it work? We need to take people and put them onto the teams who have the appropriate organizational knowledge, who have the appropriate cultural knowledge, who literally know how to work internationally. And it's a skill. 
I've worked on a lot of international teams uh, spread across North America, uh, Europe, and Asia. And there are some team members who absolutely work well in the international environment and some who don't do it. What does it take to work well in an international environment? Well, again, I think every individual is going to do it differently, but it's an awareness of the time zones. It's a willingness to work with time zones. It's awareness of cultural differences. It's an awareness of norms. It's awareness of everything that's different between the Canadian team member, the US team member, the European team member, and the Asian team member. It's a willingness to understand the differences and it's a willingness to expand upon and to leverage and to take advantage of the differences to the overall team's betterment. And it absolutely requires each and every team member to work hard at having effective communication skills whether it is email, whether it is voice calls, whether it is video calls, whether it's text messaging. Terms and conditions that we use in North America will not be readily understood by people working in other continents, other cultures, other organizations. So again, we have to want to make it work. But if you have reasons you have to have your team distributed, it can happen. It just takes a little more work. And making it work applies whether it's distributed by team or within team. As just discussed, we probably have to focus a little more at making it work within the team. But the same thing applies even by team. The Canadians have to understand the cultural norms and differences between themselves and the American team and the European team and the Asian team. The, the within team still have to understand the time differences, the cultural differences, et cetera, et cetera. But the majority of the communications is going to be within the team, within the same culture and norms. So yes, it applies in both instances, but again, probably a little more appropriately within the team. Everyone has to be committed and committed in two forms. They have to be committed to Scrum, which I think is a given. We, we've discussed all of the principles and norms of Scrum throughout this Nugget series. Doing Scrum, being Scrum, is all about embracing Scrum, being committed to Scrum, and working hard to make Scrum work. So in one sense, distributed Scrum is no different than non-distributed Scrum, but because it's a little bit harder, we want to make sure the team members are committed to Scrum and they have to be committed to making it work in the distributed mode. And if all of your team members, and let me stress, all of your team members aren't committed to Scrum and aren't committed to making Scrum work in a distributed mode, you're probably going to have some challenges. And I would suggest if you get any sense that you have team members who are not committed, this is probably not the project for them to be cutting their teeth on Scrum. It's okay to put team members on who are learning Scrum, who are absolutely Scrum green beans, provided they want to become Scrum gurus. So again, I have no issues with putting a learner on a distributed team. I just have issues with putting a person who doesn't want to be Scrum onto a distributed Scrum team. Far more poison than in a co-located team. Discuss this already. Everybody un needs to understand the cultural norms and everybody needs to support the need for cultural norms. Each country, each location, each culture is going to behave differently. We have different interpersonal spaces. We have a different needs for formality. We have different uh, respect for, for authority. And speaking of authority, in a Scrum environment, there is no real authority. Scrum is focused on a team approach. And I'm not to, to say that there are cultures who do not work well in a team approach, because I don't believe that to be true. But there are cultures that are more hierarchical, more authority based. So again, as you're, you're selecting your teams to work in a distributed Scrum environment, if you have team members who are of a culture that are more hierarchical, authority based approaches, ensure 
that they are willing and able to accept the fact that this is a non-hierarchical, absolutely peer environment, and that they don't have an immediate supervisor to look to and expect to give them guidance. So not only do we need to understand and support cultural norms as we go through the project, we need to make sure that the team members themselves understand that there will be nuances that may violate, that may change, that may work against their own cultural norms. And I would suggest we need to embrace the cultural differences. I'm aware of distributed teams that actually, I'm not going to say honor, but I am going to say honor all holidays worldwide. And before you get too excited that says, oh, I'm going to sign on for Steve teams and I'm going to get 32 paid stat holidays a year because I'm going to observe the Canadian and the US and the France and, and the British and the Chinese and the Australian national holidays, that must equate to 30 paid stat holidays a year. That's not quite what I mean. But I want to honor and respect all holidays of all of the nationalities of all of the, the countries that I'm working within. So yes, within my team, if I am a Canadian team member, I will honor Canadian stat holidays. But my Canadian team members will be aware of Chinese New Year, for example. And not only will my Canadians be aware of the Chinese New Year, I would suggest a week or two leading up to the Chinese New Year as part of my daily scrum or maybe as part of a sprint retrospective, but probably more appropriately as part of a daily scrum, we would take three minutes or five minutes leading into the daily scrum where our team members from China will brief the poor dumb Canadians, and I can say the poor dumb Canadians because I'm one of them, the poor dumb Canadians on what the, the, the reasons for the Chinese New Year is, what the norms for the Chinese New Year is, what they're going to do, what they're going to eat, how they're going to dress, how they're going to celebrate. And we'll do that for the Chinese New Year, and then we'll do that for the Australian Independence Day, and I don't know that there is an actual holiday for the Australian Independence Day. So if I have Australians listening in on that, please don't be offended if I have incorrectly stated your holiday. Um, but at, again, leading up to the Australian Independence Holiday, I would have my Australian team members again go to the same thing. Why is this holiday observed? What are they going to do? How are they going to celebrate? What are they going to eat, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll come back to my... Can Canadian and we have July the 1st and yes it's July the 1st not July the 4th Canada Day is July the 1st and again as the Canadian team member I explained that con July the 1st Canada Day is the celebration of the Canadian uh, country as its birthday and I would explain what we do that we have fireworks that we typically have picnics that we get together as families etc etc so we want to embrace the cultural differences and we want to take some time within our scrum to make everybody feel special, to feel welcome, to truly work hard at making this distributed team work. Now, realizing that we're distributed around the world, I believe face-to-face -face really, really, really helps. And part of that is, as I already discussed, that we may want to send Sally around the world and make Sally a world traveler, provided Sally wants to do that. But I think even if we don't have people who are willing to travel for extended periods of time, where are the dollars? And yes, I absolutely agree that the, the, the dollars and the cost is king in business today. But where are the money, where are the budget supports, getting together, say so maybe once a year, as part of a major release plan, we can pull the team together, teams together in a common location 
and do the major release plan. Ideally, I would like to bring every single team member to that common location for a week or maybe two weeks to do not only the major release plan, but to do team building, to do et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, a major retrospective, a major lessons learned, a major whatever. But ideally, again, try to find the time to make face-to-face -face meetings work. And to me, the key is send the team to these face-to-face -face meetings. If you don't have the budget to send everyone, don't send the managers, don't send the product owners, don't send the scrum masters, send the junior team members, send the architects, send whoever is appropriate for, for the meeting, but going to these Joint international face-to-face -face meetings should not be considered to be a managerial perk. Not that the scrum master should ever consider him or herself as a manager. A scrum master is no one other than another team member who is a scrum guru. But it's not a perk for the scrum master. It's not a perk for the product owner. It's a perk for the team to help build and foster good team interaction. Now, Team norms, absolutely, again, are critical. What do I mean by team norms? If we're working in a distributed environment, it's honor the time zones. What does that mean? If I, the scrum master, am in Canada, I, the scrum master, should not schedule all meetings that support my time zones and my workday. So we have to honor the time zones and we have to stagger the meetings. If I have team members in Canada and Asia, I need to find a way to honor the time zones. And that's a really hard one to honor because we're almost exactly 12 hours apart. So how do we do it? Do we expect somebody to, to get up and attend a meeting in the middle of the night? Not ideal but maybe that's the way to go, provided that you're willing to share the pain. So for the month of January, the Canadian team attends the meeting at very odd hours. And for the month of February, the, the Asia team attends the meeting at the very odd hours. But maybe it's the find the middle ground. And with something as large as a 12 hour time zone, probably the middle ground makes the most sense whereby we pick something that's, that's six hours uh, awkward for the Canadian team and equally six hours awkward for the, for the Asia team. Not an ideal situation, but we have to find ways to make it work. But again, if we're dealing with a European team where there's only four hours difference, again, probably can find a time for the meetings that absolutely has some overlap for the common business hours may still be a little inconvenient for those who like to work very late in the evenings or who like to work very early in the mornings, but find some way to honor the time zones that it's not favoring one team or the other. And establishing team norms comes back to standards for text messages. I'm a huge fan of using the social media for team communication. So if you're using an instant messaging system, make sure that your status is relevant. If I'm at my desk and working, my status should be ready. If I'm going to lunch, my status should say at lunch back within an hour. Why? Because I don't want my team members who are four or five, six hours time zones away happen to say, okay, it's now three o'clock in the afternoon. So that means Steve is, we want our text messaging status to make it clear and obvious to them whether I am at my desk and ready to chat, whether I'm at lunch or gone for the day. And a, pet, a personal pet peeve of mine with text message statusing is, I take my laptop home at night, I hook it up to my home network, my text message, my instant message comes up and shows me as ready, but I've gone upstairs to play with my, my children for, for two hours prior to bedtime. My, tack, my status is showing ready, but I'm not. So again, focus on developing team norms. What's the expected response time for emails? Uh, 
Should emails always be treated as the last thing we deal with? Or should all emails get priority, especially all emails from team members, that the team norm is within two hours, two business hours, of receipt of an email from a team member wherever they are in the world, the expectation is we'll respond to them, and so on and so on and so on. So if we establish team norms that people's expectations for response, that people's expectations of available to reach me in my time zones are there. I've kind of touched on this one a little bit already, is ensure there's time for small talk. And when I say I touched on it, it's in terms of honoring the holidays worldwide. Absolutely, I think we need to do that to support the cultural norms. But if we're not going to have a lot of face time, we're not going to get the, the time for the team. So maybe, just maybe, our 15-minute scrum should become a 20-minute scrum. And I know the purists are saying, but scrums are 15 minutes. You've told me to ensure the scrum t never takes longer than 15 minutes. We have to honor it. We have to adhere to the rules. And the answer is absolutely yes. But maybe our distributed projects team's norm is for the first five minutes, it's chat time. So team member from Asia. What's the weather like there? Is it summertime? Is it wintertime? What's the average temperature? Do you get a lot of rain? If you make time for the small talk, people are going to bond with each other. I remember way back, probably my very first distributed project, I was working with a, a, a few team members who were about a four hour flight from where I live. And it was a very low budget project. So we didn't expect we would ever have the ability to fly and meet each other. I didn't ask for this as the project manager because I was new to distributed teams. But one of my team members in that other city sent me an email with six pictures of her. And the email said, hi, I'm Rosemary. I'm really excited to be working on, on your project, Steve. And I just want to introduce myself. In the first picture, you see me sitting at my desk. So now you know what I look like. In the second picture, you see my entire family. That's obviously my husband and my three children, Betty, Sam, Sam and, and, and Holly. Oh, and the third picture is us on a family vacation. We went to the mountains last summer and we had a fabulous time and, and note our family dog in the, in the corner. So Rosemary took probably no more than five to 10 minutes of her time to send me this quick email. But wow, what a difference that made. Now I had a face to put on her. Now I knew she, what her family situation was. I knew what she liked to do. I knew a lot more about Rosemary. So whether you expect people to send these pictures in this quick biography, and some people, the extroverts are going to be absolutely ecstatic to do that. But some of the other people are going to be more private. Well, yeah, I don't mind sending you a single head and shoulders picture of myself because I, I, I kind of appreciate knowing the same thing what Steve looks like. But I really don't want to show you pictures of my family. I don't want to share my, my vacation details with me because that's, that's an invasion of the privacy. And we have to be very sensitive to that. But if we make this five minutes of upfront small talk, I'm not asking for pictures. I'm not asking you to tell me what you did in your vacation. I'm not trying to pry into your personal life. But if you tell me it's raining, if you tell me that in average in the month of, of March in Nova Scotia, which is where I live in, in Canada, it is a horrible month because we're going to get snow one minute and then we're going to get freezing rain and then we're going to get drizzle and then we're going to get fog. And March is not one of my favorite months in the province that I live. I'm, and I'm not saying that's small talk to allow me to complain about my weather, but that's just letting people know a little bit more about where I am and what I do and maybe in the middle of March, where I get on the call and I'm really, really grumpy, people can say, oh, Steve, this must be another one of those really bad weather days for you, is it? And the answer is probably yes. Talked enough about fitting to the time zones. Make it work. Make it work fairly for all team members. And as I said already, tools are key. 
because our teams are distributed around the world, we need to have automation for our product backlog. We need to have automation for all of our project artifacts. We need to have uh, automation for all of our, our progress charts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we can make distributed Scrum work. And I think we've probably spent enough time discussing the fact that tools are key in a distributed Scrum, but we need the tools for the product backlog. My cork board and my post-it notes or my index cards aren't going to work in a distributed team. So I need a Scrum tool that's going to mimic a product backlog. And it needs to be a tool focused on supporting a Scrum backlog. I don't suggest you simply go out and use a standard word processing software and a shared file folder somewhere and call that your product backlog. There are some really awesome tools out there that are focused on, and I'm going to say mimicking the concept of a product backlog that we actually have the concept of index cards and we can pin them and we can move them and we can prioritize them and we can assign them responsibilities, but we need appropriate scrum tools for the product backlog for producing our artifacts. And for producing our progress charts. As discussed earlier in tools, I'm not going to recommend a specific tool. Which tool you use is going to be based on which one of the specific agile principles you're applying and how and where and, and the approach that you're using for your distributed scrum. But the key is find a tool and use it and expect that you're going to need a little more documentation. The stories need more detail. The documentation needs to be just a little more complete. And I'm going to say fatter. The everything we do in a distributed scrum needs to be one plus size bigger. More details in the scores, more documentation, better training, more detail in the user's manuals more everything simply because the norms, the expectations, the availability of the team to look over the shoulder for that business user in the US trying to use the results of the story that was coded by the Asian team. The team is not there to look over the shoulder during that first walkthrough. So therefore we need just a little bit more detail to make sure that the worldwide organization is effectively able to use the worldwide results of our project, recognizing that the over the shoulder probably doesn't work in a distributed environment. So just again, be prepared for that slight extra bit of documentation in a distributed Scrum world. And this concludes our nugget on distributed Scrum. We talked about the ways we can distribute Scrum, where we have teams, entire teams, distributed geography. Or we can have teams themselves distributed. So in this case, we have a single team in country one, country two, and country three. In this case, we have team member one, team member two, and team member three distributed across country one, country two, and country three. The norm is we will do our distribution by team and distributed scrum by team applies many of the same principles as we had discussed previously in scaling scrum. A little more effort is required if we need to distribute our scrum across geography, but within the team being distributed, it works. It takes a little more effort, effort plus plus, but if you have reasons why your distributed scrum needs to have your team members distributed across geography, it will work. Just try a little harder to make it work. And the key, no matter which way we're doing distributed scrum is make it work. It takes a little more effort. It takes a little more focus by the entire team. 
But if the entire team is focused on, dedicated to, committed to making distributed Scrum work, it will work. And a last comment is because the team is distributed, a lot of the traditional paper-based principles for product backlog, for user stories on index cards, for information radiators slash progress reports on large bulletin boards isn't going to apply. So we need to have automated tools and these automated tools need to be Scrum focused tools and your distributed Scrum will work just fine. This concludes our nugget on distributed Scrum. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.